Welcome back to The Breakfast uh, this morning. And uh, of course, so we're still having a conversation on uh, the president's uh, statements from yesterday in reaction to incidents in the southeast. He's also spoken with regards to uh, INEC offices being damaged and uh, uh, preparing for 2023 elections. We're speaking still with uh, Nicolas Ibekwe, an investigative journalist, and uh, Mr. Kemesit Effiong, the head of uh, research at SBM Intelligence. Uh, thanks for staying with us, uh, to both of you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go back to Nicolas Ibekwe. Uh, you're from the Southeast. You visited the Southeast a lot of times, like you've said, lately. Um, but I, I want you to, you know, re speak on, you know, the incidents and how it makes you feel uh, seeing the almost complete militarization of the Southeast um, in the wake of these events. You spoke also of uh, Operation Python Dance, uh, Python Dance, Egwiki, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and, um, you know, the new ones now. But there's people who have mentioned that there are certain parts of the Southeast that when you walk past, you have to raise your hands up. You have to step down for your, from your vehicles and lift your hands up, you know, before you pass. Um, how does that, you know, seem to you? Well, well, the South has been heavily militarized even before all of this. I mean, try and travel to the South East during the festive period, and you would count tens of checkpoints from all the way from Ore or down to or even from yeah, from even from, from Shagamu actually. The, the amount of checkpoints you, you would count, and these are basically aimed. Um, at um, southeastern uh, travelers. I mean, if you, tra if you have traveled on the road in the north before they became um, very insecure, before it becomes um, a security thing to do now, have traveled in the north, have traveled all the way from, from Kebi State to Kaduna on the road. My brother, I did not see one police checkpoint from Kebi State to Kaduna. I did not see one police checkpoint. That was a long trip, uh, lasted for over six, seven hours. I did not see one police checkpoint on the road, not one on the road. So if you compare that to a short trip from, um, even from the head bridge, I mean, for I, I am from Oyu, and I am traveled towards um, the uh, Oweri or the Char road. I mean, in, in, in the ordinary days, you could see up to kind of 15 checkpoints in that short um, distance. So the South is, what we are seeing today is not new in the South East. We have seen it in the past, this reason of hand and, and everything. It's just that the intensity we are seeing that now is, and this is part of the reason why we have this discontent, this distrust for the government or anything government in the South East. Because people, because if you also observe, South East are perhaps one of the most traveled people in this country. So they go to other places and they don't see this kind of heavy security. Even at this, at the period when the South East was, was peaceful, when there was no attack of, of any form, we have this heavy militarization of the South East. And they see these things and they come back and they, are, and they are wondering, what is happening here? Why do we have this, I mean, heavy police and military presence in, in the South East? And we don't have it in, even in the North where we have bandits and everything happening. We, we, we didn't have, we don't have any of this. So it's a concern, and the government has to really see that, and we think it's approach. I mean, I was in the, I was in the garden of top army officers um, just a few days be, before the uh, late chief army staff um, um, had that unfortunate uh, crash. She was actually at the garden in Ibadan. When I was, I was called as a, as a discussant to come and discuss the image of the army and all of that. I was yeah. there. And I told the, all the redneck uh, generals who were there, I mean, and I told them, the fact you've had pint and dance one, two, three, four, up to six, what have you achieved? The South is, is still resting. IPOP has become more powerful. You beat people on the street, you fuck people, you shoot people. I mean, straight bullets killed civilian, young kids working on the street and everything. What have you achieved? It doesn't achieve anything because I said you mean your aim is just to go there and subjugate people. If your aim is to find a lasting solution and you have tried this over and over again, and rather than solving the problem, it has worsened the problem. Don't you think it's time for you to think of a different approach? You know, so that's what I would tell the government. The, the evidence are just there. Look at the evidence. Nothing has been solved. I mean, the, the, the right. trust has become deepened. Insecurity has become deep in. You send in trucks, show of force, and everything. That was the time the government had in Ambikanu. They, they, they made him speak through their finger because of this so called show of force and all of this nonsense that they were doing. So, I mean, right. it's, not, it's nothing. The government should look at it. All right, really. let's, let's go back to uh, Mr. F. Young. Um, 
Um, uh, I saw a couple of comments um, in, in response to the president's um, handle and the tweet from yesterday, and people, you know, had mentioned that oh, you know, there was something similar that um, happened, or you know, a similar reaction from the presidency before the incidents um, and reaction to the NSAS protests, October twentieth, um, and the incidents of uh, in Lagos that night. Um, and so there are those fears. So I, w I want you to speak on the possibility of tackling the criminal elements in the Southeast that have led to the destruction of INEC offices and police stations without having any innocent casualties. Is there still that possibility seeing the reaction of President Muhammadu Buhari yesterday? I mean, even without the president's reaction yesterday, the possibility of you know the security um, authorities uh, are carrying out any of the activities without, you know, the sept, uh, you know, under the sector of, you know, human rights or, or you know, without anyone being susceptible to human rights abuses was probably non-existent. Our security authorities have shown and have a well-documented track record of human rights abuses. So that wasn't going to happen. The president's statements probably just um, amplified the space, you know, and the opportunity. Uh, for that to happen, which, you know, which is uh, you know, which is tragic and unfortunate, because like you rightly pointed out, we are coming on the back of um, we are coming on the back of I think nine months now since um, the the entire protest. You know, very little has been done to to tackle the issue of you know of police and, and state sponsored brutality, and we are looking at a situation where the military is about significant um, the, the security authorities in this case, rather, because it's not just the military that would be um, spearheading these activities. You're looking at a situation where the security authorities uh, um, might be, you, you know, might significantly escalate one of those more latent, you know, one, one could argue frozen uh, uh, conflict, right, that, uh, that, that we've had in Nigeria for a while. So, so whichever way you look at it, the opportunity, and then, you know, once you situate that within the context of Nicola's point about uh, about the Southeast being um, over policed and over militarized, it is basically that the security authorities are forming a game, okay. right? You know, they are used to doing things, you know, the way they've always done things, especially in places like the Southeast and getting away with it. And there's nothing to suggest that this time will be any different. All right. Um, I want to go back to Mr. Ibekwe. And Mr. Ibekwe, you mentioned earlier about, you know, the state of roads leading to the Southeast and how it seems to be so heavily militarized. And after, you know, the, the alleged assassination of Gula two days ago, the Arawa Consultative Forum had a meeting yesterday where they issued a travel advisory to Northerners against traveling to the the southeast because of you know all the insecurity challenges so with you know with this new travel advisory the murder of Ahmed Gulak in the southeast you know just all the security situation there burning of police stations attacking of INEC offices and police officers at checkpoints how do you think this is affecting the image of the southeast as a whole this is my this is my major concern with um, ESN or IPO how do you turn your homeland into a war zone? I mean, my understanding of war is that you go out to fight a war, you fight the enemy, um, maybe at the border of the, of the town or something. You don't invite them to come in. I mean, so Nambikanu seems to be, seems to have his mindset on one agenda. He has this Biafra, this Biafra utopia that he has in his mind. And he, he doesn't care how many blood of evils would have to sacrifice for him to have his Biafra utopia, where he becomes the supreme leader. Already, IPOP members are, are referred to him as a supreme leader. So there is a, there's a, there's a cult of personality in the form of what we have in, in the Kim's family in, um, in, um, in North Korea, already being built around the Namdekano. If you see the way um, IPOP members eulogize him and they worship him, they basically have deified him, really. So uh, that is what he wants. He likes the trapping. He likes all those. Uh, so but for him, he doesn't care how many people have to die if that is the only path for him to get there. And he thinks this is the only path for him to get there. So and the government is basically playing into his hands. So the point I, the point I keep saying is that it is disheartening because I have folks who live in the southeast who cause me. Businesses have shut down. Life has not, life has not been the same um, in the southeast since December this year. You know, as things have become very difficult for the people. 
who are, who are the people who are concerned, people can't even speak freely. If you understand the way the South is traditionally is structured, it's a Republican uh, a culture where everybody has the right to air their views. I mean, if you go to, uh, we have Umuna meeting, where people sit down and discuss issues over and over and over and over again, before they are resolved, this is the misconception most people from other parts as of the South is had and say, oh, Igbos are not united. No, we are united, but we, we, we believe in discussing, in dialoguing. You know, we believe in dialoguing, in dialoguing and discussing issues before we reach a solution. You can be in a village, we have different kindred in a village. I mean, if you have like five or six kindred of a village, and six of them, or maybe four of them say they are doing something, the fifth kindred can choose to say, I don't want to do it. And everybody respects that. And they are fine. That is how the Igbo culture is. But look at what ESN is doing now. You can't even debate with Kanu, um, not the Kanu and his followers. It's either their way or the highway. Okay, so know. Mr. Ibrekwe, um, the last question for me today will be, earlier you mentioned um, about how it seems the South Easterners are being marginalized and how the mm. president needs to make sure that everyone has a sense of belonging, you know, seem to have that, you know, belief that they belong to one Nigeria. And we know that South Easterners have been clamoring for, you know, the presidential slot, saying they're the only, you know, region in Nigeria that has not had a chance to be president yet. And we know there's the controversy between APC and PDP zoning the presidency for 2023 to the Southeast. Do you think a Southeastern president would solve all the agitations and make South Easterners believe that they indeed belong to one Nigeria? Also, do you think that with all the insecurity and you know agitation for a Biafra Republic, that even the APC and PDP will be confident enough to even zone the presidency to the southeast? Mr. Ibekwe and Mr. FM, please. Uh, quickly, um, just, uh, so that FN, FN can end, um, is that first and first, uh, the misconception, there's a lot of misconception that the people who are acting for Biafra is just a fringe amount of people in the southeast, not the whole of the southeast. So it is okay. wrong to paint the whole region with that brush of that we want Biafra. I mean, what the southeasterners need is a place to do their business. We are business people. We, are, we, we want to trade. We want to move freely. We want to be able to import our, 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 our goods. We don't want our goods to be stuck at the port for, 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 for weeks and be accumulating demo rage. We want to, be, want to do business. We want to make money. We like, we like the easy life. Go to Owere, Owere, now that that is burning, Owere used to be the, I mean, the, I used to call Owere Nigerian Las Vegas. It used to be the enjoyment city, I mean, in, in the Southeast, you know. So we just want to do our thing and go. And it's also a misconception that they say, yeah, we understand that for equity and all of that, presidency should rotate and all of that. But who are those clamoring for them? Is that the top politician in the South? So the Southeast the presidency solved the, solved the problem. It will, it, it, I don't think it will solve the problem unless there is, the problem can be solved by a northern president who addresses those concerns and the, those fundamental concerns are not that of the presidency right. to come to the southeast. They are far from that. So, Mr. F. Young, okay, we, we hear you, Mr. Ibekwe. Mr. F. Young, what do you think about that? Do you think if we have a president who's from the southeast, you know, that will solve the issues there? <laughs> No, not necessarily. And I think it's um, it's it's a bit of um, I, I should I should probably not use you know the word and it's but but I think it's um, I think it's disrespectful to the sensibilities of the Southeast to imagine that if you wave a totem at them, then um, you know all of those historical, uh, uh, political, you know, and social and economic issues that they've had with the Nigerian states will be solved because that's really what the presidency is. The presidency, yes, is powerful. The president has a significant amount of, you know, leeway under our constitution and under our democratic tradition to get a lot of things done. But merely occupying the position is not a guarantee that the right policies, that the right policy framing and thinking will be enshrined. I mean, you know, look at our current president who's from you know, I mean, who's, who's, who's from the Northwest and look at what the security and the economic situation in his home region is. So, so it's really not by that. Would it help? It would help somewhat. But the fact of the matter remains that any Nigerian president that appropriately engages with the Southeast, that is smart and is intelligent and brings the right people to the table and gets the right policy setting right done, 
will go a long way towards addressing right. the situation in the Southeast. It doesn't have to be someone from the Southeast. It just has to be a president that has a national right. mindset. Mr. Ifeong, um, national um, mindset. finally, and you know, I'm going to bring in a very tricky angle, um, you know, in reaction to the president's uh, messages yesterday. I, I saw two p particular messages that I thought were very interesting. The first one is from a guy called, uh, from a handle called FS underscore Yusuf. It says, my heart goes out to every Igbo in the country. I, I bear, I may not bear your name or speak your language, but I share your pains, light, strength, and love uh, to you all. There's also another one from Emma Abaga, the rapper. It says, all of us non-Igbo Nigerians should make tomorrow a day of solidarity to stand with our Igbo brothers and sisters. We cannot fix the years of hurt, but we can say, well, we can with one voice say we are one, we are together, um, and all of that. Yeah, so... Um, is this an interesting angle in reaction to, to this? Well, it, it is from the standpoint that um, you, you, are, you are seeing a clear um, generational divide in an understanding of how national issues and how national politics work. Now, for a much older generation of Nigerians, who oftentimes participated or were born, you know, um, during and under the scepter of the civil war. There are, there are very, very deep historical and animosities that remain. Is that apparent in, you know, in our generation, in Nicholas and mine and your generation? That's also apparent. But, but I think one of the things which is shifting is you, you're now seeing an increasing number of Nigerians, especially those who are not of the Southeast or a South South extraction who are making an effort towards educating themselves about the issues. And the fact of the matter remains that if you closely watch and observe Nigerian politics, then it's very, very clear and apparent that policy making towards the South is, is significantly different from policy making for the rest of the country. You know, it used to be the case that, you know, the South South also used to enjoy, well, enjoy isn't the word, but the South South also used to be at the receiving end of that kind of policy setting but you know the, the debate around the derivation right in the early part of our return to democracy post 1999 went a long way towards um addressing that issue that and coupled you know with the fact that you know our dependence on oil receipts has only deepened right within that time frame the southeast has not had the opportunity of having a concerted nuanced contextual contextualized you know, a far-ranging conversation with the Nigerian state that the Southeast has been able to have. Until that conversation happens, lots of Nigerians, and especially young Nigerians, will increasingly see that dichotomy between the way Abuja treats the Southwest and all of the Northern regions, and increasingly the South-South and the Southeast. And the logical question is why? And as long as you know that imper the imperative for that questioning or that line of questioning will remain, then you would see a lot more people who actually will skip, speak up about this, mm -hmm. and not just people like Likunas and I who are from the region or who are, who are close to the region. I should All right. say. Thank you very much, uh, Ikemesit F. Young. Uh, thanks for your time this morning. Nicolas Ibekwe also, thank you very much uh, for joining us yes, and for spending both. your Wednesday morning with us. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, and we need to remind Nigerians that the message really is unity, um, no matter whatever it is. Um, the hope really is that the presidency uh, drives towards ensuring security for all and that we all live in, in unity and peace. Um, it's a wrap here on The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. My name is Annette Felix. Thanks for joining us. I am Osao Ogbonwa. I'll see you at 9 a.m. for the news brief. Good morning.